Um, thank you for your interest and support of classics here at the college. This year's colloquium also has the support of a number of entities on campus, specifically the Sustainability Literacy Interest Institute, which provides students with the tools and techniques to engage with our campus-wide initiative uh, entitled Sustainability Literacy as a Bridge to Addressing 21st Century Problems. This colloquium relates to this year's theme of social justice and fair distribution. We are also supported by the Office of Institutional Diversity, which is committed to creating and sustaining a vibrant campus environment and supports initiatives to improve and enhance cultural competency and fluency at the college. So thank you both uh, to the uh, SLI and to the Office of Institutional Diversity. And in addition, I'd like to shout out to the uh, Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture, Department of History and the African American Studies Program for their assistance in promoting this event and the Classics Club and Ada Sigma Phi for, for their assistance, uh, most in, mostly uh, notable for the uh, reception and, and, and Nimbly Bits uh, right over to stage left. Uh, lastly, the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs and to its Dean, Dr. Timothy Johnson. Uh, the School of Language, Cultures, and World Affairs has been a consistent and essential supporter of the series for which we are continually thankful. Uh, Dean Johnson is a person for whom many in this room uh, needs no introduction. Dr. Johnson came first to the college as the chair of the Classics Department. One of his first actions actually was to institute the Classical Charleston series. There is much I can say about him. All of it positive. Well, most of it positive. Yeah, but, um, suffice to say, much of the vibrancy and energy that we see today in classics at the college can be attributed in large part to his leadership over the years and his effect upon uh, our landscape, uh, for which we are ever thankful. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dean Timothy Johnson. As you look around the room and see the technology, you will know I had very little to do with this. <laughs> Jim kindly asked me to say a few words. Although diversity is a diverse topic itself, I'll attempt to follow his advice and make my words brief and few. Classics, it's well known and often said is one of the founding disciplines of the College of Charleston. I suppose from the beginning, a type of seal for this institution's quality and clientele. And a short walk to the Northwest over my left, your right, my right shoulder is a statue of John C. Calhoun towering over Merrick Marion Square. And at roughly the same distance to the southeast stands the birth home of Basel Gilderslave. Here we are today between these two old men. As another graying bearded white male, <laughs> I think it is most apt to stand in this place at this time between those two monuments and ask if I can turn off my phone. I'll talk to my wife in a minute. <laughs> As we stand between these two monuments, I'd like to ask, what does real diversity look like? And how does it function? Classics can signify excellence, but does it do so when it is associated with an elitism that frankly is distasteful? When in fact, first, classics is for everyone. Classics is not specialized. Whatever the ancients experienced, thought about, and talked about is a field for our consideration, and we stand without limits. Secondly, classics is everywhere. And so are my wife's text messages. Classics is everywhere. In my travels these past two years, from Cuba to Chile to Spain to Latvia and Russia, in some form, classics has been in all those places. Classics is global. 
anti-exclusivity lives somewhere deep in the classical heartbeat. So thank you to my colleagues, friends, and especially the speakers for coming together over diversity and working with us to help us confront our past and forge a better future. So thank you all for being here. Here's to the excellence of everyone and to you all. Enjoy this episode of Classical Charleston. I'm going to int introduce our first speaker. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sam Flores and I'm an assistant professor of classics here at the College of Charleston. And I'm here to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rebecca Fudo Kennedy, who is associate professor of classics and um, at Denison University and the administrative director of the Denison Museum. She earned her PhD at the Ohio State University <laughs> and taught at Howard University, George Washington University and Union College before her arrival at Denison. Her research interests include the intellectual, political, so, and social history of classical Athens, um, Athenian tragedy, identity formation, and immigration in the ancient world. She's the author of two monographs, Athena's Justice, Athena, Athens, and the Concept of Justice in Greek Tragedy, which, is public, which was published in 2009, and Immigrant Women in Athens, Gender, Ethnicity, and, the citizen, and Citizenship in the Classical World, which was published in 2014. She's also the co-editor of Race and Ethnicity in the Classical World, um, the Rutledge Handbook to Identity and the Environment in the Classical and Medieval Worlds, and she co-edited and co-translated Race and Ethnicity in the Classical World, an anthology of primary sources. Um, and she's the editor of the Companion to the Reception of Aeschylus. So despite recent anonymous internet trolls, she's published quite a lot. Um, and she's currently writing a book on race and ethnicity in antiquity and its entanglements in modern white supremacy. And she's co-translating a source book of ancient texts on women in ancient Greece and Rome. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Kennedy, who will be speaking on Western civilization and the whitewashing of the multi-ethnic ancient Mediterranean. Thank you. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, can you see me over the monitor? I'm not the tallest person. Um, and I think this is on, so if I move, hopefully, if I move over here, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so first I wanna say thank you so much to Sam and to James for inviting me. Um, I was actually born in Charleston, so it's, this is a homecoming for me. I was born in the US Naval Hospital. My father was a Marine and we lived on a trailer park um, on 29 Palm or Isle Palms, which I don't believe is a trailer park territory anymore. Um, <laughs> it's changed a bit. Um, also, College of Charleston was my first ever job interview. Um, and I bring this up very specifically because obviously when I didn't get the job and I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> but actually, the reason why I bring this up is because this was in 2003. Um, and in 2003, I had this interview. Um, it was the first one I'd ever done. It was in New Orleans in a hotel room or in a I'm all, I'm all like ringing because of this. Um, but I was in New Orleans and one of the questions that they asked me was, how would you help introduce the diversification of classics, <laughs> right? This was 2003 and supposedly, <laughs> right? Supposedly we didn't start caring about diversity in classics until you know last two years ago or something. But this has actually been something that a lot of people in our field have been worried about since the 1980s and the early 1990s. Um, I didn't answer the question very well at that time, and I think part of it is it was my first interview and I was terrified. It was my only interview, in fact, um, at that point. Um, so I'm really glad to have this second chance to come back and answer the question again <laughs> um, on diversification and the classics, uh, diversifying the classics. Um, so I want to start today actually in a somewhat obvious place, um, but also a not obvious place. And I, I want to start with Bernard Knox's um, 1993 book, The Oldest Dead White European Male. So thank you for previewing um, <laughs> old white European males for me. Um, obvious, I say, because we seem to be in the midst, once again, of a culture war that is not unlike the one that prompted Knox to deliver his lecture on, as he calls them, DWEMs. 
And the adversaries Knox imagined for himself at that time, and that all right-minded classicists um, would have seen at that time, seem to also be the same as now. Quote, advocates of multiculturalism and militant feminists, end quote. This is 1993, right? It could have been yesterday. <laughs> or it could have been on the job wiki <laughs> uh, for classics. <laughs> Um, not obvious, though, to go back to him is because one would actually think that things might have changed significantly within the field over the course of the last 26 years, and yet here we still are. We inhabit a field that is hovering around 90% white, women are still underrepresented in the ranks of the tenured, classics is still debating whether it contains within it more of the Mediterranean than just Greece and Italy, Archaeologists and historians still make up only tiny slivers of departments, while all people who are deemed worthy of being called classicists are expected, regardless of any other skills, knowledge, or future specializations, including Bronze Age, um, Mediterranean, to focus the majority of their undergraduate and graduate training on, the Greek, on Greek and Latin languages at the expense of any other languages, literatures, histories, methodologies, or materials. In short, 26 years on from Knox's publishing his essay, the field still is predominantly focused on the exact same canon made up of the exact same practitioners. The problems that I wanna think about today are one, the diversity of the field, two, the diversity of our methods, and three, the diversity of the world we study. They are all intertwined. I'm gonna focus most of my time on the diversity of the world that we study um, and how we can access that. Um, because I think that's um, what I'm best at talking about. So I want to start with the easier problem, right? And this is the world that we study. And I want to think about, you know, why does 2019 look hardly different from 1993 in so many ways? Why are we still here? How do we move forward? Do we need to move forward, some would ask? Or do we, like Knox, imagine that the problem isn't us? We're not the problem. Uh, I think many of us, though, after the last few years, of seeing classics showing up more and more and being mobilized more obviously in the service of fascist, racist, and misogynist contexts, and in particular, given the events of this January's Society for Classical Studies meeting, uh, the repercussions of which um, are still happening now, if you don't know what happened, um, there were a couple of events that took place at the conference where um, two of our um, uh, student members were racially profiled by the hotel that we were at, um, they had been invited to the conference by the organization that I was chair of in order to receive an award for their extraordinary work in founding um, a collective organization called Sportula, which, founds, which provides micro grants to students who are in need in the classics community. Um, at the following day, and I will actually um, begin with a quotation from what happened the following day um, at the Futures of Classics um, panel, um, we had a member of our field stand up and give a full throttle defense of classics as Western civilization to the exclusion of other things. We'll look at the quotation in a minute. Um, and then implied at that point that certain members of our field only have their jobs because they are not meriting it necessarily, but because of the color of their skin. It's a problem. <laughs> we have a problem. I think many of us think that the problem is us. It's not out there. It's our problem. And by us, I mean any classicists among us who believe that there is nothing wrong with a field that is built on exclusions and elitism, and who posits that, quote, advocates of multiculturalism and militant feminists are somehow outside of classics, and the work that we advocates do is somehow not real classics. So that's what I want to talk about today um, and sort of position us. I want to start with this quotation. Um, and then what I'm actually going to do is I'm not going to give a formal talk I am going to go through some materials and talk about them. And what I really would like to see um, is to have a conversation um, with the audience. I know that some of the students in the class, I didn't get to make it to the class earlier today and they had read some of my, my publications, um, but I, was, I had the joy of being on an airplane where we got delayed a half hour because a drunk man needed to be removed from the plane. <laughs> it's quite fun. So I've had an exciting morning already today. Um, but I, I think it's, it would be better to make this more of a dialogue uh, in some ways. So I will talk, but if you have questions, please go ahead and intrude. I'm okay with it. So this is um, her defense of Western civilization. And, and I think it's a very interesting defense because one of the things that it makes clear is that for people within our field, and she is fairly representative, um, I can think of a number of people who would say this um, very directly. 
Um, ethnic studies, women's studies, these are balkanizations of the field. These are not real classics. Real classics is Western civilization. And what they mean by Western civilization is a very important thing. So last week I gave a talk in the UK and I was talking to them about the history of the word, of the phrase Western civilization. Many of us think that this is somehow a, a, a long-term uh, concept. This thing goes way back into the Middle Ages or back into antiquity. But in fact, if you search for the word in English, uh, the phrase in English, it only starts occurring in the late 1890s. And it really doesn't start picking up speed until the 19-teens and the 1920s in the US. In the UK, it starts a little bit earlier because West and Western civilization become part of the discourse through which to talk about um, how to manage the British Empire. Uh, they're not really sure what to do, but they know they have to start making these decisions in the world. Um, in the US, it starts picking up speed, interestingly enough, as the American eugenics movement starts picking up speed. Uh, and as Jim Crow starts picking up speed. But also as unionization takes place. So when Russia, um, the Bolshevik revolt in Russia took place, there seems to be what some scholars have called a crisis in whiteness. Um, so that there had been, of course, this idea of whiteness <laughs> in the United States and in the UK and in other places that could contain all Anglo-Saxon peoples. During World War I, this is, there's stress put on this identity um, because, of course, the Germans are the ones they're all fighting against, and there's a realignment uh, between the French and the UK and the British, um, a realignment in their imperial interests. That's fracture number one. Fracture number two has to do with the rise of Bolshevism and the rise of workers' rights and the lower classes um, as a sort of power uh, within Europe and within the United States. The American eugenics movement and the UK eugenics movement were singularly focused not on people of color, but they were focused on working class people and ex preventing them from breeding with other proper people who should be breeding. So that what we see is that the term Western civilization actually begins to fill a, a space. It's a space that can be white, that can be Christian, but can also be explicitly elite. And this is where canon formation comes into play. Simultaneously with this rise of Western civilization, we also see, and I think here's where we'll see why classics get so yoked to it, is that Western civilization as a concept within academia emerges at the same time as classics is being pushed to the fringe by the quote unquote practical arts. So for example, in 1897, Columbia University <laughs> cut its Greek requirement for acceptance into its college and they reduced their Latin requirement. 1898 is the first term use I've been able to find in the United States of the term Western civilization. In, um, what was it, 1917 or 18 is when Columbia cut the Latin requirement for entrance into Columbia. Lo and behold, within the next five years, the great books curriculum develops. And the great books curriculum is the first canon building um, exercise that took place in the academic world. Um, the great books, of course, are, you know, things like Homer and the tragedians and Thucydides, um, sometimes Herodotus, sometimes not, depending on who you ask, uh, Virgil, <laughs> obviously, and then, of course, they start building Dante, um, uh, Cervantes, others. They'll, they'll allow some foreign texts in. They even throw in Jane Austen to make sure they have a woman for good measure. Um, but it really is premised on the idea that this is the best of the best. As classics get pushed out, they reinvent themselves as something else so they can get put in. This continues until we get to World War II. In World War II, um, we end up having a very interesting trend. This is when the Western civilization curricula, as we know them today, emerged. And they emerged specifically in, an anti, uh, in a Cold War space. After the war, um, uh, World War II, the United States turned very quickly away from denazification and they turned quickly to anti-communism and the russians they decided because the rest of europe didn't revolt the proletariat didn't rise up that they became anti-western they're the ones who sort of invented this idea of the anti-west um, and so the cold war is really when we get a solidification of the concept of western civilization so it's not that new 
Uh, if you're interested in reading about that sort of war, World War II configuration, Kwame Apaya um, has a recent book out called The Lies That Bind, and he has a chapter on culture um, in which he talks about that Cold War configuration of Western civilization. Uh, but that's what Western civilization is. It is an inherently, it was developed as an inherently white, Christian, and elite term that was meant to actually erase the racial categorization uh, of, of West and of white. Um, classics gets yoked to it um, as a survival mechanism in many ways. People who think that classics is in crisis, you know, as where the languages are um, not as enrolled, et cetera, this has been going on since the beginning of time um, at the university level. Um, once upon a time, anthropology was considered a practical art, um, and it was one of the ones that was pushing classics out. But so when people like Mary Frances Williams here tell us that classics is Western civilization, there are many of us who get, you know, the little hairs on our neck stand up and we get very concerned because when we hear Western civilization, and if you look at the comment sections on the articles that tout uh, the brilliance of Western civilization, they all assume it means white, male, Christian, elite culture. Um, there was an article recently, not the one that came out on Quillet yesterday, but uh, a few weeks ago, defending Western civilization. And without a single word being said about Islam in the article, all of the comments were about anti-Islam. So there is a coding that goes on when people hear the phrase Western civilization that might not be what we as a classicist might mean to signal, but that's what's being heard. And if you look at the history of the term, that's exactly what it's meant to, 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 to mean. Um, so, that's our starting place, I guess, for thinking about what Western civilization. And what I'm concerned about is when we say Western civilization and when it's assumed to be a white Christian, how the Greeks can be Christian um, is a later issue, right? But a white Christian and elite space, what happens to the actual ancient Mediterranean world? <laughs> because the ancient Mediterranean world wasn't a white safe space. It was three continents of people from all over the Mediterranean and all the way into Asia and into South Africa and, and all over. Um, and so what I like to do uh, in my work is to try and bring that world back. Um, that is considered being a multi, an advocate for multiculturalism, uh, apparently, and that's a bad thing, according to many people. All right, so let's go ahead and start with this issue then. So here's our good friend Bernard Knox, um, the oldest dead white European males. He says the following. So he's talking about the complaints that these um, militant feminists and these advocates of multiculturalism say, he says, the critics seem at first sight to have a case. The characteristic political unit of classical Greek society, the polis or city-state, was very much a man's club. Even in its most advanced form, Athenian democracy, it relegated its women to silence and anonymity. Racism in our sense was not a problem of the Greeks. Their homogenous population afforded no soil on which that weed could easily grow. There are a lot of things that one could unpack in this. Um, I will pick out two very quickly and then focus on the last one. The first one is, of course, that he posits the city-state in its most advanced form to be the Athenian democracy and posits the apex of Western civilization in antiquity as um, classical Greece, this sort of short time period in Greece in which it had this radical democracy. And he also posits what was important to the Greeks as only being politics, war, um, and symposia. He gives you a list. And of course, these are all places that women aren't supposed to participate. But of course, if you read Herodotus, the world is a very different place than if you read Thucydides, um, or if you read instead of Demosthenes' speeches against Philip, and you read instead Isaias and the other orators, there are women everywhere. And of course, if you read material culture, you see women everywhere. Um, but they don't get to be in those places because only classical Athens means Greece and only the pu public spaces get to be considered as part of his canon. But the last bit is the one that's of interest to me. They're homogenous population. One of the things that's very interesting, of course, is that we have a problem when we're talking about race and ethnicity or diversity in the ancient world, is that we always project our own categories and, and ways of thinking back onto um, whatever we're studying. Um, so he doesn't see any issues of racism uh, in our sense of the word because he's not looking for it on the one hand, but also because he makes an assumption that Greeks identified themselves as Greeks. Of course, that's not a Greek word uh, to begin with, so we have one problem there. But also, if you know anything about the Greeks, um, and if you've read Herodotus, you know that he has to beg the Greeks to think about themselves as unified Greeks. What I imagine, though, what I imagine is that this is the world that Knox imagines for the Greek world. 
all that singularly colored red space. These are um, where the Greeks had colonized and set up new city-states uh, throughout the Mediterranean as of 550. Um, notice everything is uniform in color. No recognition of dialectical differences in language, no recognition that these were all foundations from different independent poles. Um, what we have instead, though, if you actually want to know, I'm going to give you a little tiny slice because if I put them all on a map, you wouldn't see any land, you would just see dots. Um, <laughs> these are is a more accurate reflection of the Greek space uh, in these centuries. This is a small number of Greek colonies um, that you see here. They were all independent political entities. They had their own militaries, they had their own governments, they had, many of them minted their own coinage, they had their own diplomatic relations with each other. They may have had a relationship with a mother city that, that had originally founded them, but usually after a few generations, they really didn't want to be bothered with that home. And many of these colonies, in fact, um, were intended to never communicate back home to begin with. When we talk about identity in the ancient world, we can't talk in terms of Greeks. One of the things I always do when I teach Greek is the first thing we do, or when I teach ancient Greece, is we deconstruct the concept of ancient Greece. There is no ancient Greece. Ancient Greece is a fiction. Uh, it's of our own imaginations. Um, Greece itself, of course, is a 19th century um, creation. So when we think about Greeks, we can't talk about a homogenous population other than the fact that they all speak <laughs> some form of Greek most of the time, but not all of the time. Many of these poles are actually mixed populations that sometimes speak Greek, but also speak things like Carian, or they speak Demotic, or they speak Dif Oscan. Um, we find inscriptions from lots of different languages. Um, even within the older poles from the mainland, like Athens, um, we find multilingual inscriptions that show that these were not, these were multilingual populations and not monolingual populations. If you can measure identity and ethnicity through language, which you can't necessarily do. Why can't we do that? Because after the fifth century and the fourth century, we get this. I don't expect you to be able to read anything on that map. All you need to see is that red squiggly line. Does anybody know what this is? What is this? This is the conquest of Alexander, all right? That red squiggly line is the direction that Alexander's army went. And everywhere he went, he planted little Greek cities, usually named Alexandria, sometimes named Bucephalia. Um, if you guys ever have a chance to go on to Horrible Histories, do Horrible Histories Alexandria. Um, and you get to see a really great skit of Alexander naming cities after himself all over the world. Um, right? So there might not be a lot of diversity in the name of these cities, but what we actually have is a lot of diversity in terms of who gets to become quote unquote Greek. The definition of Greek changes dramatically after Alexander's conquest, because to be Greek is simply to buy into the culture in many ways. Um, all of those lands are not inhabited by Greeks. Greeks might make up a small portion of the population or none of the population. What makes them Greek is that they learn the Greek language, that they build agoras and go to the theater, and they do other things that mark them as Greek-ish. This is great, though, because this is going to be a precursor to us for the Romans, because the Romans, if anyone ever thinks that when you say Roman, they mean an ethnic group or a racial group of people who came from Rome and then went and spread themselves out through over the world, they know nothing about Roman history. They're making things up. So here's another map I don't expect you to be able to read. What I want you to be is overwhelmed by the number of small words, because all of those are independent markers for independent peoples who resided within the Roman Empire millions of whom called themselves Romans because they were Roman citizens. They used Latin when they filed their wills. They might not know it very well, and you better hope that they trust the guy who's copying that will out for them. But, <laughs> right, they used Latin for wills in the law courts. Maybe they spoke Greek. A lot of them would have spoken Greek. Maybe they spoke um, Aramaic. Aramaic is another one of the dominant languages. You know, maybe they spoke Demotic. There's lots of different languages. Maybe they still spoke some of the old Persian languages, right? Dozens of languages, people with dozens of different gods and different types of practices, but all of them called themselves Roman by the time we get to 212 uh, CE, or at least the free ones, right? Because this is the other thing that nobody ever talks about in the ancient world, right? Our slaves. So if we want to keep our Greeks to just Greeks, then we have a problem with the fact that the Greeks are bringing into the city Millions, not, and I'm not kidding, millions 
of people uh, over the course of seven, 800 years um, who are not Greek, but are living in Greece, are speaking Greek, are putting Greek tomb style tombstones up, they're worshiping Greek gods. And with the Romans, it's even more so. Because with the Romans, of course, if you want to become a Roman, if you're a slave, you're freed, and you become a Roman citizen with some restrictions, but your children are Roman citizens with no restrictions. Uh, but I think more importantly is that um, one of the things that happens, and I'm, we're gonna go to talk, talk about this in a second, but I think it's a, an important thing to point out. Whenever anyone, I have a conversation with anyone about race and ethnicity in the ancient world, they're immediately their mind goes to, I must be talking about Africans. And if I mention the word Africa, I must be talking about black Africans. And they use this category called sub-Saharan Africans, which is entirely inaccurate because we know for a fact from our good friend Herodotus that they all believe that what they called Ethiopians who are black Africans were indigenous to West Africa and North Africa. So this is a misnomer that people often use, but it's something that you have to sort of wade through when you're dealing with these topics is how people misconstrue or what their assumptions are about what you mean by race. Um, but it is an important thing because we know, because the Romans had this freedman system where you could be a slave, you could be freed, and then you become a citizen, we know they had black African citizens. Why? Because over the course of the Roman Empire from about the first century BC to about 400 or 500 CE, um, there's a, a historian, uh, named Caitlin Green in the UK who has done all the math, they probably brought between six and seven million slaves from Africa, <laughs> black African slaves. So there are lots of Romans running around. So even my friends who tell me, oh, they, we don't have race the way we have it. If you use race the way we define it, um, they're Roman citizens. Um, so I think it's really important for us to understand and recognize that when we use this language of Western civilization and we refer to the ancient Roman world as a basically a white, Christian male elite space, we ignore a whole world of antiquity. And we ignore it in part because we are trained through this concept of Western culture and the Western canon to only read elite texts. And what we don't do is we don't read the inscriptions. We don't talk to our archeology span friends. We're not supposed to historicize our texts um, with that context. We're supposed to love Virgil, and, and no offense, I love Virgil. Um, we're supposed to love Virgil <laughs> aesthetically and for the language that he provides us and not for what he might be able to tell us about the world in which he lived. Um, so just keep this in mind, I think. Um, so here we have um, what I like to do when I talk about race ethnicity in the ancient world is there really are a couple of ways to do it. Um, the first one is to actually use modern categories that include skin color. Um, and Knox does this in his famous uh, old dead white, oldest dead white European males. He says, they are white. Oh, but I actually mean they're probably olive skinned. Uh, here we have some Fayum, Fayum portraits uh, from Egypt. Uh, these were um, the portraits that were put on people's mummies. Um, and as you can see, the sort of olive toned skin is probably about accurate, right? Um, but Shelley Haley wrote a wonderful article um, a few years, I think it was 2009, um, in a study of early, race and early Christian studies uh, called Be Not Afraid of the Dark, in which she asks us to really consider browning the ancient Mediterranean world and really thinking through what it means. Because white doesn't mean the color of our skin. What white means in its modern context is the absence of color. So when someone says, I'm proud to be white, what they're actually saying is, I'm proud that I'm not brown or black. And that's a problematic situation. But if we actually recognize that the ancient world is a, is a series of non-whiteness, right? It's, it's full of color, uh, as Shelley asks us to do, then we can actually maybe break away from this skin color dynamic when thinking about the ancient world as if that's the only way to think about race. And this is important, I think, because race isn't actually about um, skin color at the end of the day. Um, it's about systems of power. Um, this is a couple of quotations from Ger uh, Geraldine Heng's new book. Um, it's called The Invention of Race in, the early, in early Modern Europe. Um, and she's actually using um, critical race theory structures that think of race as technology, as a way to actually structure the world we live in. So she gives us here race as a sorting mechanism, a structural relationship for the management of human differences, or a tendency to demarcate human beings through differences that are selectively essentialized as absolute and fundamental to guide the differential apportioning of power. Um, 
this is sort of a way to understand that when we talk about race and ethnicity in the ancient world, what we're talking about is not do they look like us or do they act like us, but rather um, how are they structuring the categories of human difference. When you use Western civilization as your overarching moniker, you just assume they all look and act like dead white European males. Um, but I think if we use either one of these two configurations for talking about race, ethnicity in the ancient world, we actually get an amazingly different view. We get that map back, that map that has all those little different places all over it. We get a view of um, the ancient Mediterranean that has a range of peoples living in it who all qualify as Greek and Roman. I had to put this up here. Have you guys seen this? Um, this is, <laughs> it came out like two days ago or something like this, and it's really freaky. Um, it's awful. It makes you realize that Nero probably was as awful as you thought he was. Um, even though I think someone told me that the neck beard is actually not original to the sculpture, it's added later. If anyone can confirm this for me, I would love to know. Um, <laughs> but this is what happens. But I, I put this image on here because this is what happens actually. When you restore what you think, you take these sculptures and you restore color to the sculptures using 3D technologies by assuming that everyone is actually Northern European. This is what Nero ends up looking like. He doesn't look anything like how the Romans represented themselves. No Roman would look, want to look like that. <laughs> and I know we often talk about the Romans using veristic portraiture, but I don't think this is what they meant. <laughs> oh. Someone did actually put up a side by side. I should have put the, I should have got the meme. This has become a meme, obviously, on Twitter already. Um, someone put it side by side with the evil leprechaun from the horror movie Leprechaun. <laughs> and it's like the same person. <laughs> They're like, who wore it better? Um, <laughs> so. But this is what Western Civ does. Western Civ is a concept that makes everybody look like Nero and erases everybody else. It makes our map look like this instead of like this. Um, and so what I basically am asking everyone to think about is, let's think about race and ethnicity in the ancient world. Let's think about both the way we conceptualize race and ethnicity and also trying to understand it on their own terms of how the ancients conceptualize it to try and bring back the color to the ancient world to try and bring back all the varieties of peoples who made up the Greek and Roman world because the classics isn't actually, as far as I'm concerned, um, the Greek miracle. This is another meme that I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> so just, just so we're aware, um, just so we're aware that's supposed to be a pile of sugar. <laughs> make that clear to everybody. <laughs> pile of sugar, not the other thing that's white and powdery that people stick their face in. Um, <laughs> because this is the question we need to ask ourselves is, if we know that the world is a, is a brilliantly colorful place, if we know that the ancient world is multilingual and you know, filled with gods and this wonderful diverse place, why do we keep returning to the Greek miracle and to Western civilization? Um, that's the kind of question that I would love for you guys to help me answer. Um, but I think this actually, this quotation from Knox will get us a little bit to um, why. So he says, the primacy of the Greeks in the canon of Western literature is neither an accident nor the result of a decision imposed by a higher authority. It is simply a reflection of the intrinsic worth of the material. There was no one selecting it. It just randomly coalesced as a canon. It's sheer originality and brilliance. As for the multicultural curriculum that is the ideal of today's academic radicals, I guess that's me, um, there can be no valid objection to the inclusion of new material, right? Because we don't mind, add it in, go ahead, put in some Gilgamesh, you know, put in some, um, some uh, Chia Quinn, right? Throw some stuff in there. But that new material will have to compete with the old. And if it is not up to the same high level, it will sooner or later be rejected with disdain by the students themselves. Only a totalitarian regime can enforce the continued study of second-rate texts or outworn philosophies. What I think is happening, why I think as over the last 30 years, classicists have pushed to 
really understand and get a more accurate picture of what the ancient world actually looked like by disengaging or attempting to disengage from this Western civilization narrative and this Western canon um, is that now they're afraid that the Western canon itself, as they've conceived it, are becoming the second rate text and the outworn philosophies that students are rejecting. Um, and I think they're afraid and I think that's why they don't want, that's why we keep going back to that model. Thank you. I think, I, I think it will add one thing though to say, as if it's a zero sum game, right? Like you can, you can only like Homer, you know, and not, you know, Gilgamesh, or, you know, you can't like Toni Morrison and Virgil, like right? as if this is somehow not possible. So there we go. <laughs> all right, Sam. All right, all right. So thank you, Dr. Kennedy for that. Um, we're gonna open it up now to questions. Um, Dr. Garish is in the back with <laughs> microphones because this, these there talks are being, this. for those of you here in the room with me, these talks are being live streamed on the internet and my phone is blowing up with Twitter notifications. Um, so for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, um, type your question in the chat feature and we have someone who is organizing the questions for us in the back. You can also just yell at me. I'm, I'm used to that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Zoom questions. So, um, I love and you can also, just to be clear, if you're a student and you read any of my articles on this material, feel free to ask about that too. Like, you don't have to restrict yourself just to what I said now. Um, I really appreciated your talk. I thought it was really wonderful and very enlightening. Um, I was curious how you can help to um, educate people who are outside of the field or have an interest in classics that are not necessarily classicists themselves. Mm -hmm. um, especially I'm interested in pedagogical aspects, so like maybe high school or primary school uh -huh. students. So one of the things that I do, do are we, is it mine fine if I go up onto the interwebs here? Um, don't save. Um, um, so I actually have had quite a few wonderful conversations with high school teachers and things. Um, so some of them are actually now, so um, Sam referred to the race and ethnicity, um, uh, race ethnicity in the classical world, an anthology of sources. This is a collection of texts that span from Homer to the fourth century um, CE uh, of different ways in which the Greeks and Romans conceptualized human difference um, from the biological, to the mythical, to um, the cultural, to combinations of them all, medical texts, um, architectural texts, astrology, um, and then ethnographies of, of all lots of different peoples who resided um, in the ancient world. Um, and so some are using that because they're in translation. And so one of my colleagues, Danny Bostic, uh, she messaged me the other day. She teaches, um, in, uh, up in, uh, I believe she's in Boston, telling me that she teaches a very diverse classroom and by using these texts, she's been able to actually help the students see themselves in the ancient world uh, for the first time. And so it's a cheap book. It's like 17 bucks or something. Uh, we didn't write it to make money. Um, we wrote it to let students actually have um, access to the text because they're unusual. And then also, so I run, a, I have a blog um, and uh, I have a whole section here. So here I have a massive bibliography if you're interested in scholarship um, of just text on this stuff, but the one that you'd probably be interested in is this one. Um, this is a page full of teaching resources that I have built up, and I've been working with um, a couple of other classics groups, the Multiculturalism, Race and Ethnicity in, in the Classics Consortium, and Classics and Social Justice, so that lots of different faculty um, are now contributing their own syllabi um, to this collection that we have here um, of syllabi for different ways that people teach about race and ethnicity in the ancient world. Um, some of them are doing comparatives with modern slavery, ancient slavery, modern slavery. Some of them do it within the context of thinking about immigration and migrations of peoples and refugees. It's okay, the other day in Newcastle, we had to compete with karaoke at the college. <laughs> it was great, like everybody wanted to do Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, uh, but also I provide a list of, that are uh, publicly, like that are more accessible. They're not scholarly articles, um, but they are, um, public facing works that are intended for non-specialist audiences from all lots of different people, including Sam Flores right there at top, um, 
But so I include lots of different uh, articles and things that people can, and these are in articles and podcasts and blogs that are intended for non-specialists. Um, so that's one of the things that, that I, I try to do to help get that out there. And of course, I have a fairly active Twitter um, account, um, which I have a block list of about 138,000 people now. Um, so that, <laughs> I know it's too big now to even share it. I think they cap at 125 before you can stop sharing it with people and let people subscribe to it. Um, but this is how I keep out the um, Nazis and the anti-Semites. Um, so I'm married, my husband is Jewish, and so we were very careful about um, the anti-Semitism uh, that can occur on the internet. Um, but I do tweet, tweet a lot. I live tweet books that I'm reading. So I recently taught a class on classics and white supremacy um, and, uh, and fascism. And I tweeted out my reading of a book called Greeks, Romans, and Germans about the German appropriations of, of the Greek and Roman world starting in the 17th and 18th century. Um, sometimes when I'm researching, so I have this big tweet that I put out that's, you know, was kind of crazy um, on some of my research on this early 20th century white uh, uses of Western civilization. Um, so I have receipts when I tell you that this stuff was explicitly white supremacist and racist. I, I've got I've got the text to prove it, and they're on my Twitter feed. Um, so so I, I try and do those kinds of public facing uh, activities. Probably an oversimplification, but either we have had, let's say, consistently over the last decades, a paradigm for defending our relevancy, <laughs> right, based on an interpretive model of of the West and the transference of a more monolithic Greece, Rome into our part of the Western world. Mm -hmm. All right. Once you commit to that, that argument of relevancy, and it's repeated across the decades, it's very difficult to change. So here's my question. Is it in fact, or could it be in fact, that the elementary and secondary education here is going to play a very vital role in making the change. Yes, I, I, I say yes. And I say this, so I have a seventh grader and she's in social studies right now. And um, looking at the way that they, so she, first off, she was in the womb when I was teaching Greek history. And I had made a joke at the time that she had learned more than my students um, while she was <laughs> in the womb. She aced her ancient Greece test, 65 out of 65 plus two bonus points without studying. So I think it's true. Um, <laughs> But uh, I look at their study guides every day, and they're not actually, they're, never will you see the words Western civilization. You see imperialism, you see colonialism. Uh, you see it though side by side. They do ancient Greece and Rome alongside of other great ancient civilizations, and they do it alongside of the modern United States. Um, so every chapter is a different ancient civilization, set of, of civilizations. They do it as a global studies course. And I think that's a really fundamental place to sort of start that. Um, when they start getting, learning about the ancient world, um, to start learning of it as a global space, right? So you're learning India, and you're learning Persia, and you're learning Greek, and you're learning Africa all at the same time, right? Anything that's chronologically linked, they just do it, they pick all over the globe. And so I, I've seen the study guides, I've seen the tests, and this is how many of the schools are doing it now, and I think that's fundamentally important. So I think you're right on there. Yeah. Yeah. And the safety of that, which we experience fundamentally, becomes, does not come to play in our favor. Yeah, I, and it's really interesting. I had this conversation um, with a colleague um, online the other day where, you know, in my 10 years at Denison, um, I've never had a student, I, I give out little survey sheets and say, hey, why did you take this classics course? Often it's like, you know, for the gen ed. Um, or, <laughs> right? or it's because my friend told me to take your class. Um, or it's, you know, because um, they took Latin in high school, um, or they played to Rome Total Warfare, or something like this, right? And they know that I do an immersion role playing game in my ancient Rome class. So they all want to like, I get lots of gamers and lots of CS majors. Um, but um, no one has ever written on their piece of paper, I took this because I wanted to study the roots of my culture, um, or <laughs> Western civilization, right? But I have colleagues who do get that, and I think part of it is, is this high secondary school training. <laughs> yeah. 
Microphone? <laughs> I could give you one of mine. I have like three. <laughs> Besides the fact that racism is a, not only it is an invented social construct, but also it is a pretty recent mm -hmm. phenomenon. So how, how would you explain the resurgence of racism, especially in America? Would it be the, afflu the affluence or the influence of what I would, I would call the, of the Hitlerism, Hitler, Hitler. Hitlerism, mm -hmm. that's my own word. <laughs> As some people have been influenced to some level by that kind of movement, mm -hmm. radical movement, yeah. or would it be in some, some area as it is belief, believed by certain as a code of honor, as in the South? Mm -hmm. Or would it be finally the same way many believe that it is there's an inner or even pathological tendency by for black folks to be violent. Would it be a psychological or a, probably even a biological tendency in some people, in some white people, to be to think that they are superior? Or, I mean, I think a lot of it is, is acculturation. I don't think we have a biological tendency to dislike people who look different from us. Um, I've been doing a lot of studies of genetics and you can't track those things in genes. Um, you know, <laughs> like I have the hate gene, you know, it's just, it's not something that we actually have in us or that we can track. But I do think that the way we talk about biology is actually one of the factors that culturates, uh, acculturates people into um, especially anti-blackness, I think, in the United States, but also in the UK. Um, the way that, that uh, are the categories that are constructed for how you track genetic codes, what they say, oh, well, this person, I can tell that this person came from the, you know, the Caucasus Mountains, or I can tell that this person came from, you know, India and 40,000 years ago. Those are manufactured, made-up categories based on human populations where they reside today. Um, and so I, I very, very... I'm uncomfortable with biological explanations for human nature, as it were. Uh, I think we do a really good job of screwing ourselves up without biology, um, particularly, um, I mean, pathologies are not something I think that you are born into, or that you're born with. I think you're born into them, and then they are developed over time. But I'm not a psychologist. Um, I just, I guess I like to believe that, um, no one is inherently violent because they can't help it, if you know what I mean. I think that people are taught to hate other people um, because of what we look like. And the only way that we can get out of that is to figure out how to, to break it. But I think we're in a period right now where um, it's being so condoned and it's being so sanctioned by the powers that be that um, <coughs> I'm, at a, I, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss. So I just do mini work where I can and help my friends where I can and, um, and hope that, you know, no, but even though I do get mail at my house from Nazis, I hope that none of them actually come to my house. <laughs> so so I'm, I, I'm not sure how, if I can answer your question, because I, I don't believe it's biology though. That I can, that I can say absolutely. I think racism breeds racism. But And I keep moving on the camera guy. <laughs> uh, in the first few years of this century, the geneticist uh, Spencer uh, Wells demonstrated that our concept of race does not even exist. Yep. It cannot be found in genetics. Nope. Whereas he was able to trace uh, people literally all over the world mm -hmm. by their migrations from their genetic history. And it, it is his explanation that what we call skin color is an, an adaptation to latitude. Mm -hmm. 
and essentially there's actually an ancient theory on that too that is exactly well, the same theory well he's just <laughs> proven it beyond any reasonable doubt well i mean we, this is this is debated so there's a big debate going on right now between geneticists um, and particularly archaeologists and anthropologists who actually study human migration yes you can in fact show that people have migrated but the way that we actually decide where they migrated from is based on contemporary populations and um, we know for a fact that you know millions and millions of people move every century. And so to say that, I mean, I, I think what you're getting back to is like the 40,000 year ago sort of migrations as opposed to the 5,000 year ago migrations. But all of these populations are continually moving and mixing up. Um, there's a controversy right now because um, uh, with ancient DNA testing. All right. So ancient DNA, um, we should probably move on to the next talk soon here. But ancient DNA testing involves um, trying to get really tiny fragments of DNA out of ancient skeletons. Um, and usually the sample sizes are really small, but there are a couple of labs right now, and one of them is David Reich's lab um, in Harvard, where he's trying to prove um, old 19th century migration patterns um, that modern archaeologists and anthropologists in the last 50 years have pretty much demonstrated have no evidence for them. Um, and they've gone back to this sort of old cultural model that's been disproven. Um, we can, in fact, yes, still say um, that there are these ancient migrations, but as we get closer to the modern period, it's impossible to actually track a lot of those movements. And what happens is that this, there's a really great book, if you haven't read it, it's uh, Dorothy Roberts' uh, Fatal Invention. It's on how the modern genetic testing industry is helping to reify old 19th century race categories by pretending and telling people that you will get your heritage if you spit in this jar, spit in this tube and send it off. Um, and what they're doing is using these categories that are actually um, recreating race in new ways. So even if it isn't actually a biological reality, people believe it is. And that's a problem with education, actually high school probably and, and lower. One more question. One more and then. I'll try and be quick. Um, I want to get back to um, Tim and Gwen's question about education. And mm -hmm. I find your anecdote about your daughter encouraging. Um, we talk a lot in my 203 class about the compartmentalization of how um, history is presented at the primary and secondary levels. Um, but it seems to me that the problem is um, so systemic, particularly when we start talking about um, Common Core and what kinds of textbooks um, the state is choosing for its teachers. Mm -hmm. And teachers' hands are tied about how they have to present yeah. their material. Yep. So I'm kind of wondering, I mean, beyond these little pockets of change that we're seeing in the primary and the secondary, levels that are encouraging what you know it seems like th there's very little more that we can i mean i think one of the biggest mistakes that we make as college professors is that we don't engage with high school and 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 middle school teachers enough um that we don't go into the schools that we don't um invite them to our conferences that we don't treat them as our intellectual equals and I think one of the best ways, at least for classics anyway, is to make sure that we are forming really strong bridges with people who are teaching Latin and classics in the schools. And if we're not doing it, that's, then we're, we are perpetuating the problem. Um, and so we need to be getting, be getting out and communicating with those, uh, our colleagues. They are our colleagues and, and two, for too long classics has not taught, has not treated our secondary um, and middle school and, and uh, K through six school educators as our colleagues. So that's, that's my answer to that one is we need to get off our butts and and, and get out there and, and be, be colleagues to them. <laughs>